Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to feel your presence here, uh, joining us for the final presentation in the Buffalo State Data Science and Analytics Fall 2020 Seminar Series. I'm Joaquin Carbonara, the chair of the DSA program, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, my friend, Kirk McLean. Kirk is the first director of Open Data Buffalo, the city's first open data portal, which currently ranks fourth in the nation on the U.S. City Open Data Science Census. He is the recipient of the 2018 New York State Department of State's Trailblazer Award in recognition of innovative service delivery for his work on open data. Kirk has been working in City Hall for the past 10 years and received his master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Buffalo. One of Kirk's main goals is to increase the use of data-driven decision-making within City Hall and increase the data literacy of all Buffalonians. Today, Kirk will be talking about navigating open data Buffalo. So thanks for joining us today, Kirk. You can start whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Kirk McLean. I'm the director of open data for the city of Buffalo. I work in the Department of Management Information Systems. That's the city's IT department. And if you wanted to email me about anything open data related or otherwise, you can email me at opendatabuffalo at city-buffalo.com. I'd like to start off these talks just kind of going over what, what, what I think is open data, why I think it's important, and then kind of place Buffalo in the historical context of the modern open data movement. And then um, hoping to have plenty of time to navigate the open data portal and um, make sure that everyone is familiar and comfortable with what the city of Buffalo is offering in terms of the open data program. Open data, there's there's many, many different definitions of open data, but the one that I've used and I think is kind of uh, all encompassing is open data is data that can be freely used, reused and redistributed by anyone. Our open data policy defines open data as publishable city data and data sets that are available online in a freely accessible format. And open data is a common good that is owned by everyone and that is easily accessible in machine readable formats. So why why is open data important? It can show it can show how the city is spending our taxpayer money and providing services. One way the city uses is performance management. We can see how city departments are performing in their duties. One one example is a city issuing more building permits this year compared to last year. Um, building permits are kind of a barometer of how uh, development is progressing throughout the city. We can see if there's very expensive building permits going on in certain areas of the city, multiple permits. Um, we can assume that development is increasing in those areas of the city. And then conversely, we can potentially see where development isn't happening as organically and maybe that's where we want to put some resources or or some incentives for developers to uh, develop in that area and that data and that information is very valuable as to how we organize our work and how we push forward on, on revitalizing the city um, it, it can also lead to operational improvements and resource allocation it can show us what is and isn't working at city hall an example is the 311 service requests. Um, when you call the city of Buffalo and ask for a service to be fulfilled, is that being fulfilled in a timely manner? One recent example during the pandemic we noticed was that recycling wasn't being picked up on time. And we could see that in a number of complaints coming into City Hall right after the pandemic hit with, within like the month after um, everywhere closed down in mid-March. And uh, what that, that led to a conversation with our recycling contractor to, um, you know, boost the level of service that was being provided. And I, I haven't, I haven't noticed that uptick anymore. Though so that led to us being able to improve the operations of that particular service. Another, obviously, very interesting for you as data science students and, and faculty is the analytics research component. Um, can shed light on all sorts of trends that tell a story about what's going on in any specific area or region of the city. Um, an example is that uh, data can show that X council district requests city services at a higher rate than Y council district. 
what's really interesting about service requests is sometimes not where or who's requesting, but who isn't requesting. So we can see maybe where there's gaps in service or people aren't as likely to call, even though we know that there are areas of the city that might really need um, more city services. So um, uh, data can really highlight areas of the city where we might need to, to put more resources. And then also very useful for innovation, um, open data can be leveraged to create apps. An example is our tree inventory data could potentially be used to build a smartphone app that teaches students about the benefit of urban trees. And uh, if we have time, I'll share the tree inventory data. There's, uh, it's a very rich data set. Key concept is that open data fosters collaboration and, and empowerment and accelerates and multiplies transparency, accountability, performance, operational improvements, research, and innovation because it's openly available for everyone to leverage. You can go in on our open data site, buffalony.gov, and start using any and all of the data that we make available at no cost. And th that just kind of creates uh, a ripple effect in. in how um, important and useful that data can be. The old adage, many hands make light work is, is very relevant um, in terms of open data and its, its power. A very brief history of the modern open data movement. I don't wanna go into too much detail, but the, mo the modern open data movement is, is roughly 12 to 13 years old, uh, not, not very old at all, and started in December 2007, when about 30 interactivists met in the San Francisco area, and they wanted to have the concept of open public data adopted by US presidential candidates. It was right in the middle of the 2008 presidential um, campaign, and they were hoping that, you know, let's make federal data more readily available and let's get some presidential candidates to realize the importance of open data and ad adopt it as one of their um, campaign points. Uh, a couple of the people that were there, Lawrence Lessig, who founded Create Commons, and Tim O'Reilly, who rebranded free software as open source and uh, coined uh, Web 2.0. And uh, one of the presidential candidates ended up adopting it in their platform. And that, that was uh, the presidential candidate that, at the time, the uh, senator from Illinois, Barack Obama. He, as we all know, became president. And when he did, he signed three uh, memoranda, two of which concerned open government, one of which open data was a pillar and uh, kind of set the culture of open source at the heart of his administration. He wanted to be transparent and participatory and collaborative. So in his first year in office, uh, within six months, of him taking the office, his administration launched data.gov, um, one of the first open data portals in the, the country, in the world, and basically was to increase the use of federal data. Here's the homepage, you're probably familiar with it. And then about four years later, New York State did the same. Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, released an executive order saying that um, let's, let's release our data as well, and they launched data.ny.gov. Data Here's their uh, homepage for the open data portal. And then Buffalo's open data journey started about three years after that, about seven years after the data.gov launched. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy started an initiative called What Works Cities. They realized that a lot of mid-sized American cities like the city of Buffalo were not opening their data like the federal government and state governments and large cities were. They realized that uh, a lot of mid-sized cities didn't have the capacity to start thinking about data or have the resources to um, build an open data program on their own. So they, they started this initiative called What Works Cities to help accelerate the use of data and evidence um, within mid-sized cities. So we signed an MOU with them in May 2016 and our engagement started in July 2016, and they brought consultants to bear to help the city of Buffalo formulate an open data program. Um, experts from the Sunlight Foundation, Johns Hopkins University, 
and uh, an organization called Results for America, and they helped us build our open data program from scratch. So uh, part of that work was all department heads appointed data liaison um, in January 2017. Um, we drafted an open data policy and published it online for public comments. We got a lot of great comments that helped the, the policy become stronger. In uh, February 2017, we released an RFP for uh, open data portal software. In July 2017, we, we selected a vendor, Socrata, um, who is one of the preeminent open data portal providers across the world. New York State also is a Socrata uh, customer. So we were very happy to, uh, that they responded to the RFP and we were able to secure a partnership with them. The policy was signed uh, in August 2017 by the mayor and uh, we started implementing the software. In February 2018, the portal launched data.buffalony.gov. So since the Open Data Portal went live about two and a half years ago, um, we've released over 30 open data sets. We've released over 30 of our geospatial assets. We've federated with the state's open data portal, which means all of the state's data from their open data portal is also searchable on our open data catalog. So if you were to type something that you thought would be on our open data portal. Maybe it's on the states like um, uh, licensed automotive businesses licensed by the DMV. That is a state data set, but you'll be able to find it on our portal as well. We participated in the first Upstate Data Summit. Um, we received uh, an award from the New York State Department of State. We've held two civic innovation challenges and partnered with AT&T to award prize money to local civic innovators. And uh, as Joaquin mentioned earlier, we were currently sitting at fourth place on the U.S. City Open Data Census, which is a crowdsourced way to see how open cities are with their, um, with their data. I think we're behind San Francisco, Cincinnati, and Las Vegas. And I believe Los Angeles is up there too. So that's a slideshow, and I wanted to, now I wanted to just jump right into the Open Data Portal, um, which is data.buffalo.ny.gov. So obviously you got a header bar here with all sorts of information, how to jump into uh, different, different data and different visualizations we've built, um, some information about the Open Data Portal. And here we've got some hot buttons. So if you wanted to jump right into city data or the geospatial data, or you wanted to look at, uh, we have some stuff specifically related to council districts or neighborhoods, um, some, some quick ways to get into the data. Uh, this is probably useful for data scientists, a link to uh, Socrata's information for developers, um, a quick FAQ about the open data portal. Welcome to the mayor, here's our policy. Here's a link to the open data census. So the, 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 most, the most important part of the, the open data portal is the data catalog. That is where all the, all the data sets live, all the visualizations, all the filtered data sets, um, any data stories we've built. They all live on this open data catalog, which is very searchable by um, any number of tags or departments. So any information you're looking for um, is, is searchable and things will start to pop up. If we were interested in 311 service requests, we can search for that. Um, so we've got 23 results. And then uh, over here on the right, uh, you can see what type of asset is it, it is. So uh, the first one that popped up is the data set. We also have things called data lenses that uh, we can get into. Someone spun up a map of open rodent 311 service requests by council district. Um, here where it says community, anyone that has an account, any, uh, any resident or some anyone that has created a profile can 
create their own visualizations or create their own filtered data sets and share them back onto the catalog. So maybe um, maybe people are interested in in this. They're they're sharing that back out with the the entire community. Here we've got some filtered views. Um, so someone just wanted to look at three one one service requests with lead paint inspection as a type. Um, we we have charts, etc. On the left hand side, you can filter. You can filter by category. You can filter by the the type of asset it is. If it's a data set or visualization or map, you could you could filter by department. So if you were looking for a specific department's data, what they have available, you can um, search by department. You can search by any number of tags. And then um, if you wanted to, you could search just the state's data or the city's data by coming down here and going to the federated domains. And then uh, here, there's just a you know a quick description so you know what what the data set's all about um, before you jump into it. So let's click into 311 service requests. And then here we land on what so data calls a primer page, uh, which is essentially the metadata page, the data about the data, um, the information about the data set. So um, here you can jump into creating a visualization. Um, if you have access to uh, third-party analytical tools like a Cardo or a Plotly, um, you can open it directly into those or Power BI, Plot or R, Tableau, instructions about uh, how, to, how to get right into those. If you wanted to, you can export the information in any number of different ways. Um, CSVs, TSV, RDF, XML, RSS. Um, every data set has Socrates uh, API attached to it. So you could pull it into any number of different softwares that you need um, to analyze and uh, extract the value out of that data set that, that you're looking for. Um, and then uh, just here, if you wanted to share this on social media or contact the owner of the data set or comment on the data set, you could do that as well. Quick description of the data set. Here we've got some featured content. Um, so, you know, if someone comes to the data set and they were actually looking to submit a 311 request, they didn't want to look at the data, we point them back that way. Um, there's data lenses. I can I can open one of those and show you what that looks like. and then. We have uh, a bunch of different data stories to show you how um, some of the way some of the ways we analyze the data and and look at uh, look at the information and try to drive value and uh, that help us make uh, data informed decisions and then they all just a ton of information about the data set um, when it was last updated um, most of our large most of our large data sets are updated daily through an automation process that runs overnight. So if you were to make a 311 service request today, if you woke up tomorrow morning and looked at this data set, you would see your service request in the data set. And then you can see the status is open. And then when the, the service is fulfilled, you can see that status uh, changed to closed. This data set goes back to the year 2008, so it's a, a pretty large uh, data set that gives you a lot of information about what's going on uh, over the years, um, how often we update it, if it's automated, uh, the source system um, coming from the City of Buffalo um, Division of Citizen Services. Um, here we try to provide any limitations that the data might have. Um, so this one um, uh, data is provided as is. A request is just a request to investigate issue. And when we go out, there might not actually be a, a valid problem or actionable issue at that location. Um, so you know, someone could go out and say, "Oh, the garbage was not my garbage wasn't picked up by the time it, we go out to investigate. It might be uh, picked up." So uh, not always. A valid service request, and uh, we just wanted to let people know 
uh, the limitations that way. Um, if there's a legal dis um, the legal disclaimer associated with the data, any notes about uh, anything regarding the data will be down here. So uh, what open status means, what closed status means, um, any associated tags, um, what the license is, um, all of our data is in the public domain. Uh, so free, free to use for anyone, however they want to use it. The, the data set itself has 829,000 rows. So since 2008, there have been 829,000 roughly 311 service requests. Um, there's 26 columns in the data set. Each row is a service request. And then here we've got all the columns. Uh, all, all those 26 columns are right here. So you can see what they are before you jump into the actual data set. And then um, we do our best to provide a very um, accurate uh, description of every column. So you're not just getting some weird column name uh, and you don't know what you know what case reference means. We try to tell you what case reference means and we do that for every every single column in the data set. And then here is a quick uh, just a quick table preview of the data. So you can take a look at the preview. Um, or you could click view data and uh, jump right into the data. So if we do that, it takes us to the main table grid view. Um, here again, you can export. Um, you could filter if you wanted before you export it. So you don't want to export the entire 829,000 uh, row data set for whatever reason, or you wanted to do some quick analysis before you pulled it into uh, a different analytical tool. So you could do, you know, status, status is open. And now we just have uh, 26, roughly 2,700 cases that are open. Um, if we wanted to do subject, um, subject contains public works. I like to do contains uh, instead of is um, because sometimes uh, public, it might say public works or it might say Department of Public Works. Um, so that, that roughly 2,700 uh, becomes 1,800. So the vast, the vast majority of uh, service requests are going to the Department of Public Works that handles streets, sanitation, animal control, um, et cetera, et cetera. A very large department that handles um, a lot of the public spaces in the city of Buffalo. And then if you wanted to, you could um, you could you could export that that filter. Um, here, uh, I'll launch the the visualization builder in a second, but um, you're able to quickly build um, graphs, charts, and and maps very quickly with the uh, native uh, visualization builder on the portal. Um, again, if you wanted to comment, if you wanted to embed this data set in a in a different web page, you could do that. Um, so uh, real quick, if we go to the visualization builder, uh, a, a real quick aside, you could if you sign in and create a profile, I'm going to show you that real quick. All you need is an email address, a quick display name, and a password, and you have uh, you have a profile. You can save all your filter views. You can save all any visualizations you make, and they save right to your profile. So when you come back and log in, you need access to that data uh, or that that filtered view or those visualizations. They're they're there right on your um, uh, profile. I'm just going to say no thanks right now. So uh, up here, there's just all sorts of, if you want a bar chart, or column chart, or a pie chart, timeline, or a map, et cetera. So I, I just want to do a pie chart real quick as a demonstration. So you, you choose your dimension. Maybe you just want to do what the status is. <laughs> 
obviously the open versus close is going to be big because this goes back to 2008. Um, but what I can do is start to um, up here in the upper right, I can start to filter that information. So maybe I just want to look at the open open cases uh, in 2020. Or case cases that the cases that were opened in 2020 that may be that may be opened or closed. So you know, uh, very quickly, you get your pie chart. 62,000 cases were opened and then subsequently closed, and the the, the roughly 2,600 that are still currently open. Um, and uh, once you once you filter the information, you could then switch to a map if you wanted to. Um, here's all the cases opened in 2020. I want to I want to add an open, uh, add, add another uh, filter. Now now I get all the just the open cases. If I'm just looking at a specific zip code, I can come in and yeah, I just want to look at what's in 14215. I apply that filter again, and you can apply as many filters as you want, as you want. So you you get down to uh, a very um, a granular map of of what you're what information you're looking for, and um, you could add uh, add layers. So you can add uh, other data sets on top of this. Um, you could um, this could be. You can aggregate the points, so this could be a, a heat map. Come in and see the the hot spots uh, around, around this part of the city uh, regarding uh, open 311 requests. Looks like there's a bunch open around here, so maybe as a um, as the as the commissioner of public works, you might want to take a closer look at what's going on here because um, there might be a lot of requests of one type. So another way, another way to visualize the data is a tool that Socrata calls data lenses. Um, so th again, this is the 311 service request uh, data lens. Um, Say so yeah, I just wanted to look at the university district, um, the 311 request. Very quickly, it filters all the other cards um, on this data lens. You can see the the university district requests are in blue. The uh, the ones that aren't are now out. Again, I just want to look at open. Uh, here's what's open currently in uh, uh, university district, and um, now I just want to look at um, specific. I can come over here and see oh, what's the most prominent. Um, type of service request that's currently open in University District, and it's housing violations. So I can click that and come back up to that point map. And now I see all the open um, housing violation service requests that inspector going to go out and and check to see if there's any code violations. And then maybe I just want to look at. ones that were open in this year so far. And then uh, again, it filters down there. And then uh, you could you could export that filtered view, and download that, and uh, put it into whatever analytical tool you want. You could also uh, utilize the API. Um, another Another thing we make available for people is we build visualizations for the public to, to, to see how things are going across the city. So um, here's open service requests. Um, these, um, these visualizations that we built, anyone can go in and look at, are also filterable. So if you wanted to just look at um, 
uh, tote replacement requests, you could go in and filter that. And these are all the, the places where people want a new garbage tote. Uh, again, you could filter just down to uh, a specific uh, council district. Um, here we do some uh, density maps of uh, service requests that are open by council district or uh, uh, census tract. Here's a, here's a timeline chart showing um, service requests by month. Obviously, November is only a third of the way through, so that you're going to see a drop there. But you can see, you know, over the um, when the pandemic hit, what type of effect did that have on service requests, if any? Um, here's a here's a the top five uh, the top five cases uh, month over month as a timeline chart. Um, the most popular service requests in a given year. Um, the most uh, the types of requests um, requested by council district. So you can, if you're interested in uh, looking council district by council district and what's the most popular ones in each one of those, you can see that. Here's a couple map. So the housing violation complaints and tote replacement requests. So um, as much information is on the data set, you could really slice and dice it a, a ton of different ways. Our, uh, the data sets we have on the portal are very, very robust. Um, um, I mentioned the tree inventory, which is a very interesting data set. Go to the I'll go to the visualizations we have. Um, so the the tree inventory data uh, shows where there are street trees or park trees in the city of Buffalo, and it also shows us where there are vacant sites um, where a tree could be planted. So um, potentially um, useful for organizations that uh, plant trees or want to you know increase the tree canopy in the city of Buffalo. So here, here's the here's the top ten trees in the city. Buffalo, uh, Norway maple is the most common tree. Um, and then here we have some information about your air quality benefits and uh, property benefits. So if there's a Norway maple in front of your house, the value increases by fifty dollars. <laughs> here's here's trees, and then here's tree vacancies. So you can see which council districts there's the most um, most spaces on the street where a tree could be planted. So you might want to focus your efforts in a certain area of the city. Here we have trees the the tree species by how uh, how how big the the trunks of the trees are and um, by the leaf surface area. So you can see you know which which trees in the city will have the most leaf surface area by um, by species. Um, here, um, we, we show a quick map of the largest trees with the most shade based on leaf surface area. So, you know, if you're having, you know, having a picnic in Delaware Park, you might want to, uh, on a sunny day, you might want to sit under one of these trees. Um, the, the data set also has information about CO2 sequestering. So, um, uh, you can see um, which which trees in which areas of the city and how big they are. Um, are they providing the um, the most protection from CO2? Are they sequestering um, CO2? Which which trees are providing the most air quality benefits across the city? Um, uh, which streets have the highest number of trees? Um, the tree distribution. So which parks have them, which homestead parks have the most trees? Uh, Delaware Park uh, has the majority of park tree, homestead park trees, and the, the others uh, have just a fraction of that. Um, so um, very, very robust um, uh, data sets. Um, some of the some of the other um, 
really large data sets that we have are crime incidents, code violations, um, permits. We have the assessment roles, so parcel information about every every parcel in the city of Buffalo, um, traffic volume counts across the city, um, uh, parking summonses. So if you've ever gotten a parking ticket in the city of Buffalo, um, it will probably be in that data set. Um, uh, vehicle tows, where the city tows to the auto impound. Um, the rental registry, every landlord is supposed to register with the city of Buffalo. Um, so we have a good handle on where the, the rental properties are uh, in the city. Um, housing, housing court cases, um, which contractors are licensed in the city, which businesses are licensed within the city, um, the location of our public schools, um, results from uh, property auctions, uh, a list of what uh, materials uh, the city of Buffalo considers recyclable, um, tax information, um, inspection information. Um, uh, historic local landmarks is is one of our new uh, newest data sets. So if we we go into that the um, the city of uh, uh, the the city's common council designates historic local landmarks. So um, here's just a, a relatively small data set of all those. So you can see the distribution of those across the city of Buffalo. Um, as as much as possible, we try to geocode all of our data sets. The um, the uh, the databases that they're coming out of the SQL databases, there there might only be an associated address based on how the information is what uh, was collected. And when we present that to the the public, we we geocode that so you have that that rich geographic coordinate information attached to that. So um, you can build maps for for pretty much all of our major data sets. Here you can see. Uh, you start to see some state data. So the city uh, doesn't compile information about lottery numbers, but the state does. It's a very popular data set for the uh, the, the state. Um, there's uh, some uh, New York State attorney registrations, um, uh, the liquor authorities list of active licenses. So, 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 so much information um, that we've made available. Um, we continue to try to identify data sets, uh, working with the, the different departments that we think would be of val value to the public. If you're looking for data and you don't see it, you can suggest a data set. There's a couple of uh, new data sets that are coming down the pipeline. We are working to get planning board, preservation board, zoning board approvals um, as a data set onto the open data portal. You can obviously go to the Common Council proceedings and see what's what's been approved uh, by the Planning Board at the Preservation Board, but we're, we're also going to make that information available so it's it's much easier to analyze because it's in a machine-readable format, and not just in a, uh, a PDF of Common Council proceedings. That's a lot of information. That's, there's, there's so much, so much more. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm interested in uh, hearing some questions and what uh, what people think and and any any comments or suggestions for data. Thanks, Kirk. A big, a big round of applause for the first part of the event, your presentation. Thanks so much. And uh, um, next, we proceed to hear some questions and a discussion. And uh, so the first question. It's on the chat box. It's from Joe Trapp. He said, how will the change in the census tracts and council district post-2020 census affect these data sets? Yeah, so I think we, we still have to decide how we're going to go about that. Obviously, changes in the 
changes in the census tracts and the council districts based on the, the reapportionment, the, the 2020 census are going to potentially affect um, where some of these data points are located and whether we say they're in, you know, uh, Maston district or university district. I think for um, history's sake, we're not going to um, retroactively change any information on those data sets. So it'll probably be, you know, historically, it was in Maston district. But um, moving forward, we're probably going to re, re obviously upload those new geospatial assets for the new um, district boundaries and change our automation transformations to reflect it. So it's 2022 and someone uh, has a 311 service request and the district change from Maston to university. It's going to say university moving forward. Great. Thanks. Yep. Yes. Uh, VJ is asking, how does 311 service request calls works? Do you use any CRM software to track? Yes. So 311, you, you, you pick up a phone and dial 311, and you get a, a City of Buffalo um, call and route resolution center clerk. They'll take your call. You can also, there's also some options online on the city's website to um, submit a service request. But if there's an issue you have in the city of Buffalo and you think the city has a hand in resolving it, you can call. And, you know, there's tons of different service requests by a whole bunch of different departments. So if there's a, say there's a dilapidated property next to your house and you want an inspector to come out, you can request that. Um, if there's a pothole in the middle of the street, you can have someone come out and fill it. If there's an abandoned vehicle in your area, you can have the city come tow it. If there's an outbreak of rodents in your area, you can have animal control come out and bait it. If there's a, a dead animal in the street, you can animal control will come out and remove it. On and on and on. Tons of issues that arise in, in cities all the time. And it's basically a non-emergency line. The um, CRM software we use is um, called Ligon, which is owned by a company called Verant. And when, when a call comes in, the, uh, the call taker basically inputs that, all that information as they take the call, and then it's automatically routed to the appropriate department's queue. Great, thanks. And actually, a quick question. Uh, the, the data for Buffalo it's not Erie County, it's just the city of Buffalo. I mean, most I, I saw you, you were going over different data sets, but can yes. you tell a little bit about the reach of your, of your office? So because most of the data coming from our source systems pertains to the work of city departments, it is going to be limited to city boundaries. But there is plenty of data on there that impacts Erie County as, as well from the, the state level. So if you go to the state data or the state data stories, um, you'll see we've, it's not, it's not perfect to the city of Buffalo because um, a lot of times it's zip code based, um, but you'll, you'll be able to see stuff that impacts um, Erie County as well on those state, state level data sets. As far as I know, the county itself hasn't released an open data portal, but I would advise them to do so if, if I had the, you know, the ear of people that made those types of decisions there. Yep. Great. Thanks. And so the next question in, in the chat box is a comment from Paul, and uh, he's going to be suggesting you lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Not first, but unless you want to, uh, Paul, unless you have some in particular that you want to, to say. Now, Dunkirk, actually, it's a city that I, I've met some of the, uh, the people working in the in the city office, and they are very interested in in improving their online data and so on. Curiously enough, there is another. Uh, Heather has a question. Go ahead. I was wondering um, if you could see how many times that the different data sets have been used or opened or downloaded, um, just so you can get an idea of how many people are actually using the open data Buffalo. Right on the metadata page, you can see how many times the data set's been downloaded. And then on the, the back end administration side, we have a, a bit of a look into how often people view and how, how many it's been downloaded and how many API calls there have been. 
Okay. The next question in line is from Joe, uh, Joe Trapp. What we've been doing internally with the city uh, departments is some of the data that we're pulling into the open data portal, we're also building uh, Microsoft Power BI dashboards for the commissioners. So they have their own personal Power BI dashboards, really slicing and dicing the data for their purposes to make, make decisions about where they're allocating resources. So they, they have they have those dashboards at their ready, and we've kind of uh, upskilled them a bit to, to use those. So they're, they're the ones that are currently looking for the operational breakdowns or how they how they want to use the information that we've made available to them. So they, they all have their own personal dashboards. And we I would I wouldn't say every commissioner, but um, a, a good amount of commissioners and we're adding Power BI licenses and spinning up new dashboards as um, as people ask for them. Great. Thanks. The next question is from Jillian. Did you ever get to make suggestions on how to improve the data that is collected? So in terms of uh, in terms of data quality improvements, I do make suggestions. Um, I, I would I would love to have a more robust data quality improvement uh, program. Um, that's something that's on, on my roadmap. By, by and large, the city does a pretty good job of collecting the data that they need for operational purposes. But there, there was, for, for example, there was um, uh, the, the Department of Permits and Inspections uses a software called Hansen and uh, there was an old version of Hansen, and then we're using a new version of Hansen, and there was a a big data migration process, and a lot of the a lot of the data from the older version was kind of the the, the garbage in, garbage out mantra, where where it like there weren't a lot of data quality checks. People were entering in information, so um, the newer software has that when people are creating new online forms and things like that I, I i try to chime in and, and say if if you put if you require a specific date time field or, or this this format of data you're going to be able to then analyze it on the back end and it'll be much more manageable you won't have to do as much transformation trying to minimize the amount of messy data it's it's a bit of uh an education process with the workers in the field that are actually inputting that information. So ho hoping to spin up a, a much larger da uh, data quality improvement education plan um, at some point in the near future. Great, thanks. The next question is from Carl. Carl Wendy, uh, do you know what the community use level is? Mm -hmm. uh, does the board of Blocks Club use that data and so on? Um, I know I've talked to the I've, I've talked to the board of block clubs about the open data portal, and we've had a, a, a data 101 program where some of the uh, block club presidents sat in on. So I know that they're they're aware of it. Um, I I know some of them are using it. You can um, if you go on the portal itself, as I mentioned before, there's a um, and uh, on the left hand side the data catalog you by community. That is all the community filtered views and visualizations that the community has built. So you can go in and see what what data people are using, what they're interested in, and how they're how they're analyzing. I do know, anecdotally, organizations like the Community Foundation are using it to try to target tenants and landlords that might be renting or own, or own houses that have um, lead paint in them and doing their uh, targeting their outreach based on the the information on the open data portal looking at like pre-1970 buildings and you know kind, kind of creating a, a profile of the the most the most likely properties that have lead paint in them yeah a good amount of examples of people using data fantastic thanks uh the next sure. question is from ashley right how do we improve our searches for collecting data how do we improve our searches? 
Well, and I, I assume that some of the questions that, that people may be asking is should they use an API or should they just download the CSV? I mean, what, what do you recommend is the best way to go about collecting the data? I'm not sure if Ashley is oh. asking that, but that could be oh. one, one aspect. But to Joaquin's point, um, if you're pulling the API into your analytical tools, that's going to, when we automate daily or update the, the data, that's going to obviously um, update on your end as well. I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't recommend unless you're looking at like a historical view, but if you wanted a, a real time or more up-to-date view, I would definitely use the API. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, and, there, and there are uh, clear uh, instructions and tutorials on how to do that API on, on the website, right? Yes. Yep, if you go to the for developers section, there's there's a bunch of different ways to, to get more information about how that API works. Yep. Great. Um, Paul has another comment. You said earlier that you're, you were a Microsoft shop. Since Dunkirk is in some financial uphill battle right now, is there any open source software? So the, the open data portal itself isn't uh, a Microsoft platform. It is a, it's a okay. company called Socrata that was purchased by a larger company called Tyler Tech. But in, so I, I think you're asking in terms of open data software, is there any open, so, uh, or open source or free? And uh, there are a couple. The most popular one is called CKAN, C-K-A-N, uh, basically a free open data portal. And you, and you can push your information to that if you were uh, uh, a cash strap municipality. We decided to go with Socrata because of all the, the rich uh, the visualization builder and how easy and intuitive it was to use, and we we uh, figured that the public would uh, much rather have that that, that ability, and uh, that has come to fruition uh, by how often we see people using it. So there is one comment by Carl, and then a question by Joe. So Carl says, thanks. I think the more use that occurs, the better the public can understand and use the data. It also helps making data better. Absolutely, absolutely, no, no question about it. A Joe Trapp's comment is, to follow up on Jillian's question, would it be helpful for you to have FOILs file FOIL requests to drive CD data sets to the open data portal? And you also talk a bit more about the process of getting sets onto the portal. I know there is a suggestion page, but I haven't found a way to view pending requests. The open suggestions section doesn't show any of the recent requests. I know there have been some. I know that some municipalities have a process where they automatically, I think New York City has this, they automatically review fo uh, FOIL requests and for, for inclusion on the open data portal. I've, I've worked with our FOIL officer in the city of Buffalo to let us know if there's any uh, frequent FOIL requests that they're getting to work with their department to get the information on the open data portal. It would be helpful, I think. I don't want to potentially inundate departments with tons of FOIL requests because that is a uh, huge workload. So I'd, I'd probably much prefer people that were interested in open data on the open data portal. You either use the suggested data set or you can email um, open data buffalo at city buffalo.com. The issue with that is that we don't have like a super robust software that backs up the, the FOIL request system right now. That is something that we, that I, I hope to, to push for uh, moving forward. I, I'm not, I'm not sure about the, the pending requests, why they might not be showing up. I'll look into that and, and hopefully find a resolution. There, see what's going on there. Great. Well, a lot of very positive and great ideas. And uh, uh, we are about out of time. And uh, are there any any last comments on your part, Kirk? Obviously, it's an uh, open data portal. So feel free to use the information however you want in your research projects, in your, in your work, and have fun. And Hope Joaquin shares some of your uh, some of your work with me if you decide to use the data on our portal. Absolutely, we will. So one last then round 
of applause. Thanks so much. And uh, it was a pleasure to, to have you do our last presentation for the fall semester. We we'll see everybody again during the spring. Have a great rest of the day and the week. Enjoy the beautiful weather.